My name is Jim Elringer, and this is the presentation for ISOCAMP 2021. This is a seven-part YouTube presentation. Now, a fundamental understanding of stabilized stops in biological systems is useful for four different reasons. I use the acronym STIR. We can use stabilized stop analysis at natural abundance levels to source material to trace materials or molecules through a system, biological or ecological system. And because these fractionation events take place continuously, there is an integration of metabolic activity over time. And that metabolic activity is recorded in organic matter that does not change over time, such as the tree rings that John Roden will talk about, or the biomarkers that Kate Freeman will talk about. We tend not to question a well-measured stabilized cyto value. I use the expression, stabilized cyto values don't lie. However, we will sometimes, and maybe even often, disagree on how to interpret the data. I use the expression, a bone of contention, and I suggest you that our interpretation is based on our current knowledge. And as we get more knowledge, those interpretations can change over time. And you'll see this if you look at the literature. Background slide number one. What are typically observed plant carbon isotope ratio values? The, the, the diagram here shows the range for C4 plants and the range for C3 plants. You might ask yourself, why isn't there a single value? Is it possible that there's not much precision in their measurements? The answer is that there are evolutionary, environmental, and genetic reasons to explain this variation. And yes, the variation is real because the precision of our analytical method is 0.1 to 0.2 parts per thousand. You then might ask yourself, well, if we do a class experiment and one group of students buys tomatoes that were grown in a greenhouse and another group of students buys tomatoes that were grown in the field, you might observe very large, very, very large differences in the carbon isotope ratios of those tomatoes. That doesn't reflect an inability to make a measurement. It tells you that something else is going on. And through the course of this lecture, we'll begin to probe and understand why do we get carbon isotope ratio variation. Part one, let's talk about terminology. I will give you a series of guidelines associated with the le this uh, lecture. The first is that the 13C, 12C composition of a material, and in this case, I'm talking about a biological material, or specifically a plant material is influenced by both sources, that is the source of the carbon dioxide used in the photosynthetic process, and fractionation events that occur during the fixation and transformations of carbon within plants. I should point out that the carbon isotope ratio values of atmospheric CO2 are close to about minus 8.6 today, and they are changing annually. Here are data from Ralph Keeling's site at UC San Diego, and you're looking at monthly variations in the average carbon isotope ratio of the atmosphere over the last 40 years. And clearly there's been variation from about minus 7.5 to um, almost 8.5 or 8.6 today. Well, what's caused that variation? Our understanding of fossil fuel emissions suggests that this variation here is associated with the burning of coal and oil, which has a carbon isotope ratio of minus 28, or of methane increasingly, which has a carbon isotope ratio of about minus 45. So we see a more or less constant slope associated with coal and oil, and as methane becomes increasingly popular with fossil fuel combustion, we see the slope begin to increase. 
Now, some of the flatlanders and climate change deniers might suggest that no, 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 the increases in atmospheric CO2 are not associated with fossil fuel burning. Instead, it's associated with volcanoes. Well, isotope data do not support that because the carbon isotope ratio of CO2 from volcanoes is minus 6 per mil. And had the increase in CO2 been associated with volcanoes, we'd see an increasing trajectory, not a decreasing trajectory. Now, a note of caution. Ecophysiologists, that is plant ecophysiologists, have made it easier to understand variations in 13C and more difficult. That is because we've talked so far about carbon isotope ratios, but some ecophysiologists prefer the term carbon isotope discrimination, and that is a different creature. Now, the traditional delta notation approach for carbon isotope ratio uses the delta symbol, lowercase d, and is the ratio of the 13C, 12C in the plant to that of an international standard, minus 1. And often, we'll multiply by 1,000 to get the more common per mil unit or term. Graham Farquhar, in the early 1980s, proposed an alternative way to describe 13C, 12C abundance in plants. And that was the use of carbon isotope discrimination, which is capital D in the Greek notation. This defines the isotope effect as a discrimination relative to atmospheric CO2 rather than relative to the international standard PDB. So here we have the carbon isotope ratio as previously defined, and now carbon isotope discrimination. Well, the isotope effect is the ratio of 13C in the air now relative to the plant, and cap delta is alpha minus 1, or R air over plant minus 1. So you'll see that discrimination values tend to be positive in the literature, whereas carbon isotope ratio values tend to be negative. We can convert between the two by using this equation right here. Now, throughout the rest of this lecture, we will not be using carbon isotope discrimination because it's largely only found in the ecophysiology literature, and that's not even all of the literature. So we can't, we will not consider Farquhar's discrimination term further because of three broad reasons. Much of the time, 13C air is not measured or known in a study. It's guessed at or inferred. 13C variations in the atmosphere do not change very much during the growing season over a two to three year period. So it may not matter to the interpretation of the data. More importantly though is a translation issue. That the use of the term discrimination is difficult to apply when you're looking at carbon isotope abundances in disciplines outside of ecophysiology. So for instance, anthropological studies, substrate sourcing studies, trophic studies, and diet studies. So you might ask yourself the question, how do we address variations in carbon isotope values of a leaf from samples that were obtained over quite different time periods, such as between 1750 and 2000? This might apply to anthropological studies, or it might apply to somebody who's taken herbarium specimens from 200 years ago and are comparing them to herbarium specimens today. Unfortunately, there is no universally accepted approach for making that correction. My good and close colleague, Terry Serling, has proposed an approach, and that is to recognize that there have been large variations in the carbon isotope ratio of the atmosphere since the time of the Industrial Revolution. And carbon isotope ratio of the atmosphere has gone from minus 6.4 to minus 8.6 today. That's a huge variation. It may not matter if you're looking at samples collected over a short period of time, but if you're looking at tree ring samples or anthropological studies or voucher studies where the samples have been collected over a long time, that 2 per mil change in the isotope ratio of the air is important. Turi has suggested, why don't we correct 
all of our leaf values back to the year 1750. That's a very intriguing idea. We'll wait to see what happens in the literature, but it's a point you cannot ignore. Background slide number two. During the course of this presentation, we'll talk about isotope effects. These are mechanistic basis factors that result in changes in 13C of plants associated with photosynthetic CO2 fixation. There's a diffusion and air difference. 13 CO2 in air diffuses slower than 12 CO2 with an isotope of effect of about 1.0044 or discrimination, effective discrimination of 4.4 per mil. If we were to deal with aquatic plants, there's a diffusion difference associated with water as well. With respect to photosynthesis, Rubisco itself is known to discriminate at about 30 per mil, but in practice we tend to use a value of 27 per mil because not all fractionation events associated with fixation are RUBP carboxylase related. If we were to look at C4 and CAM photosynthesis, there are other factors to consider, and that's because C4 and CAM photosynthesis do not directly utilize CO2. They utilize bicarbonate ions. So we must consider the movement of CO2 and its conversion from CO2 to bicarbonate in order to be fit for the fixation process to take place. So here I'll end this introductory section <clears throat> with a thought experiment. In a thin and well-mixed solution, that contained RUBP carboxylase and the substrates expected for photosynthesis. We might expect that the 13C value of products that are formed should be about minus 42.9, given that the diffusion factor is about 4.4 per mil, and that the, the fractionation against 13CO2 is about 30 per mil, and the atmosphere is a value of minus 8.5. But that's not what we see. We don't see values in plants typically at minus 43 per mil. Why is that? 